Good morning, friends. This is John Clark here with another edition of the Pentecost Experience. Last week, those of you who saw it will remember that we took the biblical evidence and considered the issue, was the baptism of the Holy Ghost only for the twelve? I think we concluded that it was not. After all, if it were only for twelve, then it would never have been repeated in the biblical material. And of course we saw that it was repeated rather often, I think. And even years, many years later, the Apostle Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians 14, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than you all. And he said, I would that ye all spake with tongues. I promised you, as much as a man can promise, that I was going to let you hear the testimony of those who had experienced this blessing in their own life and let you hear firsthand how they feel about it. And that's what we'll do today on the Pentecost Experience. In one accord for their reward They tarried for the Spirit Both night and day they stayed and prayed In order to inherit At last he came in Jesus' name In a Pentecostal shower He brought a tongue to everyone Who tarried for the power It was the Pentecost experience Sent down for you and me Sent down in love from God above to set all people free. The sound was loud to that great crowd, for heaven had transmitted the risen Christ from paradise on them while they were sinning. This got around and they were found by Jews from every nation. They all turned out just to see them shout with a vain imagination. It was the Pentecost experience sent down for you and me. Sent down in love from God above to set all people free. The Pentecost experience sent down for you and me. Sent down in love from God above to set all people free. Welcome again to our house, friends. As I told you, we have someone here who is a very dear person to me. I've known him all my life, and he will be a very dear person to you, I feel certain, by the time this program is over. He just moved to Henderson from Durham, where some good things happened to him in his life. Please welcome my dear uncle, Joseph Murray. Good. Glad to be here, John. It certainly is wonderful to have you. Amen. Dear friends, I want you to hear this man's testimony concerning the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but I want you to begin, if you will, about your childhood and how you first came in contact with uh, the Pentecost experience. Well, my first experience with the Pentecostal experience, it was a a group of homeless people brought a tent in our neighborhood when I was a small child. And the power of God, people would fall out in trances and see visions and talking in tongues and shouting. And people were stirred up so that, that they, somebody hired somebody to burn the tent down. And uh, from there on, my mother got interested in it. And just a few years after that, she received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that's my first introduction to it. Having it in my home and being raised up in. How did it make you feel? Well, it was it was uh, something convincing about it, all right. That uh, it was so real that you could not deny it. Could not deny. Could it. not deny it. It any time something real comes around people, it, it brings forth reaction. Yes, it does. And uh, the people reacted in an adverse way to burn that tent down. You told me once that it, it frightened you at one. At one time, I remember one occasion when the power was falling so, and in the room it seemed like a light came in the room, and it scared me. And I jumped out the window, <laughs> ran. Just being a child, you know, it was 
It was something astounding to me. It is astounding. Amen. Didn't your mother used to take you to uh, meetings around in the community? Everywhere. I, I go with her. And, uh, on one occasion, I think the first time she ever went, we were went on a buggy. She and my older brother went on a buggy and came back. And she was so convinced, or God was convincing her that this thing was right, that a light came in the pathway and she thought a car was coming behind her. And this light stayed on the roadway and, and it was right in a place where the mule had run away with the buggy before with six kids in the buggy, tore the buggy all to pieces. I have scars on my body where I was wounded in that accident. In that same spot, that light came and followed her all the way home and shined up in a big oak tree there in the yard until she took the mule out and put the mule in the stall and then the light faded away. And that was how, and that was so convincing to her she just couldn't be stopped after that. She probably thought a car was coming down. She the did. Road. She said it was so bright she could see a pin in the highway, in the road right. Well, it was shortly after that she received she the experience? She did soon after that, yes. Well, tell me what the, some of the ministers did with the power of God in that in community. That, in that same community, I saw a man under the power of God sit down in the fire, turned the logs over on him and... and Put his hands all down in it and sat there. He didn't want to get excited, just sit in the fire. And he got out and stood in the floor and people examined him. Not a singed thread on his coat could be found. And some people accused him of having put powders on him or something. But it was the power of God. Nothing could do that but God. And you saw it. You I saw that when I was just a small kid. Were, was your family uh, persecuted for this? Oh yeah, we were just counted as outcasts in the neighborhood at that time. It was, it, the people were so stirred up about it, you couldn't even be associated with anybody harder. But what about the quality of life of the people who received this experience that you know about in that community? The ones that I knew were honest, upright people, lived right, and treated everybody right. And, uh, well, then why, why were they hated and persecuted? Well, it was just because it was something new, I guess, and uh, they didn't believe it. You had to be a believer to get to be favorable towards. I, I suppose so. Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. And you know what those signs are, don't you? Yes, I do. What are they? That, that, in my, name, in my name shall they cast out devils, they yeah, shall speak with new it. tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing. It shall not hurt them, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I had the Lord to appear at my bedside one time and quote that scripture to me. My, my. And, and how many years after that, and, and who was the minister that got you on the, on, in your heart desiring this experience? Your, your father came through in about 1932, and there was a spirit about him that just convinced me. I was not attracted to it until that time. I, Felt like I could just go my own way, but there's something about the spirit that he brought in the neighborhood. It was, it was just a peaceful spirit. And did he have the, the healing and the power? Yes, and the, he was. He had been anointed to heal the sick, and he was the one that actually convinced me that God was real. And he's been a big factor in my life for me right up until this time. How old were you when you first met him? First time I met him, I was 17. I think it was 1932. Well, you, you didn't receive the Holy Ghost, no, right? No, I was went on for years not thinking that I was good enough for this experience. And by, and now I understand that that's why I needed it, because I was not good enough. <laughs> I, I needed it because the, I needed more to be more like God. And I had a conviction to, to do, do better, but I knew in the way that I was living, I was sure to go to hell. And but I would readily admit that I was a sinner, but but I didn't make no move toward God because it just felt like it wasn't good enough. Well, many people refuse to become involved with the Pentecost experience because they they think they're in a, they're too good. They now, don't well, need it. That's, that's but you felt just the opposite way that you right. weren't good enough for. That it. was something that was going to uh, convince me right here lately. I'd rather be in a condition. To not feel good enough and to feel too good and not want it. Amen. Because this this thing is real. This is life eternal. That's a, that's a curious thing. I I have been talking to another lady, whom I intend to have on this program in the not too distant future, Sister Manning. You yeah. know, her, yes. down near Momire. Right. And she told me that on several occasions that when she first came in contact with this experience, that she felt 
Could that ever happen to me? Yeah. Is, is that ever anything that I could have too? It wasn't a. It was the attitude like, could I ever receive this? Would God ever be that good to me? Yeah, you felt that I way. I felt the same way. Yes, I did. Friend, if you're feeling that way, it may be that the Spirit of God is calling you to the experience He's about to tell you about yes, right now. Sure. Tell us what the events were that led up to you receiving the baptism. Well, I was. I, I went in the army when I was 26 years old, and I. Felt like I'd just go on and get in the army, maybe and be killed, and it'd all be over. I, I I had that attitude, and I got in the in the army, and I was sitting in the recreation room one day, and I was in uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, I believe. I picked up a Bible. I read in the Law of Moses where certain things, certain sins, that if you did it, you were worthy of death, and you'd be stoned to death for it. And some of those things I had done, and I was deeply convicted. That's the first time conviction it was seized on me. The law of Moses is a good thing. It leads you to Christ. Amen. Where we're all the healthiest right now. Amen. And I and there I started seeking God after that and I and I made up my mind. I got a ten day furlough and I came home. I, I decided I would never go back to the army unless I got a touch from God. And I spent Amen. my first ten days, nothing happened. I stayed nine more days. And we went to a prayer meeting one night. And on the ninth night, and God touched me, and I got shouting, half and shouted all over the man's house. And I got on the, got on the car. Someone carried me back to Raleigh. Got on the train, started back to San Francisco. Got out to Indianapolis, Indiana, and and the MPs and the SPs come through checking the passes. Found I was nine days overdue. They took me off the train, put me in jail. Did they ask you why you were overdue? No, nobody asked me why. I was just was. That's all. <laughs> So they put me in jail and then carried me out to Fort Benjamin Harrison the next morning. And I spent seven days there working on the garbage detail. And they, since nothing was against my record, they let me go on back by myself to San Francisco. Then I had a little trial and they put me on 30 days hard labor, they said. But that was the easiest duty I ever had while I was in service. God was still blessed. Just still feeling good. But that chain was broken because I did not receive the Holy Ghost. And it takes the power of God to, to save a person, to keep a person from sin. And I, I walked into the day room one day where, where there's a bunch of pool tables in the Army base. And they had a game. The boys had a game going. And I had run a pool room in my hometown. And this man was in there that, that knew me. And he happened to be from my hometown. He said, you get in that game. And I'll furnish the money. And, and you won't have to get furnish you the money. He said, you just shoot and I'll furnish I got in there and shot some pool and broke up the game and made a couple of almost impossible shots. And when I walked away from that table, that good feeling that I had received mm -hmm. left me. And I was right back in the same condition I was before. Did you know it? Did you realize it then that the good feeling, the closeness to God had left? You just felt vain and empty for, for the touch I got at home. Uh -huh. That had just left. It has mm -hmm. gone. Then I came out of service and I was still under that. Even while I was hanging around your father, John, I'd go uptown, and they, he was good to me. He didn't condemn me. He just told me that that, that was not right, and what, those girls couldn't feed me to hang around, go up there and lose my money and everything. And he he helped me, and that and I had a I had a vision or a dream. I dreamed about going uptown to that pool room where I gambled. Try to go in that door, and I'd walk in on one side, and, and there was an angel in the door. And he threw me out in the street. That's how I got delivered. Every time I tried to go through that door, he threw me out in the street. And, you and I got delivered from that gambling demon right okay. there. And then a few days after that, I, I went off down to Florida with a load of gospel tracks. Me and another brother from North Virginia, some of your daddy's tracks, and I went down there and stayed three months and distributed those gospel tracks. And finally, after about, it was on February the 15th, 1951. God filled me with the Holy Ghost. We walked into that tabernacle that day in the beautiful singing. The man was teaching on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, the power of God came in that place. And everybody in there raised their hands rejoicing and praising God. And the power fell on me. And over here on the left was a lady rolling the back of the benches talking in tongues. Another elderly lady up front was speaking in tongues. She had received it. And I just threw up both hands and went down there and submitted myself to all those preachers. I said, this is what I've got to have. My sister, I, my mother, and three of my sisters have it, and I've just got to have it. 
and the pie of God threw me in the floor and I laid there flat on my back. Felt like nothing was touching that floor but the back of my head and the back of my heels. And all of a sudden, that power came up through my leg. I feel it right now. Praise God. Amen. It came up through my body. When it got up to my tongue, I started talking a language I had never heard before. Just clattering and clattering, talking away. And the preacher took me by the hand, raised up my hand, and said, Folks, here is a newborn baby in Christ. I was so wonderful. And after that, I went outside and sat out there on a bench under the orange trees with all those good smells. And if I'd have been in heaven, it said, and then that would have been to the end of the world, everything would have been all right with me. John, the main thing of it is, though, is to keep that thing going until to, to we, to we get ready to leave this world. And I just, just that's just what I want to do. Hey, Keep yeah. that thing stirred up so I'll be ready to go when Jesus comes or calls for me. I just realized you telling that that uh, I was born about nine months after you were born in the Spirit. Yeah, <laughs> I had my second birth just before you got your first. Yes. Praise. God knew I was going to need you. Well, I'm glad I'm here, John. <laughs> Praise God. It's wonderful. Well, this has been a wonderful testimony. Praise hey. God. And it's kept you all these years. Yes, and about that healing. Oh, you want, yes. I want you to hear this testimony about his healing that he had of cancer. The doctors gave him 60 or 90 days at the most to live. That's right. Go ahead and tell about how that Well, I, I married after I got back up, to, up here in North Carolina. And my wife and I didn't, we just disagreed about something and separated. And uh, she went to California, and I went out there, sold everything I had and went out there. I couldn't get in a job there, so I came back home and went to Florida. I was working in the celery swamp. I said orange grove before, but the celery swamp's where I worked first. And I worked down there about three months. No, I was working in the orange grove. Let's cut it wrong again. I was working in the orange groves this time, and uh, I got a knock came in my side, and I got everything I'd eat, I vomited it. And, every, and I just got so, I was so weak I couldn't work. So I, I ain't, a big knot came in my side. and I, So I got on the bus and came home. I came to the doctor down in Nash County. And he sent me right on to the VA hospital. I started making tests to see what I had. And they found I had cancer that was malignant. They said, cut it out. Had nothing to do but cut it out. So I signed the papers for him to cut it out. And they cut into me. Found so much cancer they couldn't take anything out. So they wired me back up, sewed me up, and told my mother and my sister about 90 days would be it. But uh, just before, just before I knew what I had, I was lying in my bed when I was waiting for them to take me to the x-ray, and I had a vision of an angel coming and taking me by the hand. He led me down a little pathway. He set a pail in the, in the path, and he dipped in that pail, and he poured it on my head. When he did, I came out of a vision. And I was lying back on the bed. And then they cut me open when I found all that cancer. And after I got those tubes out of my nose and everything so I could walk up and down the hall, I met the chaplain. I said, man, do you, got, do you have any Bibles in this place? He said, yes, son, we've got some down in the chapel on the fourth floor. Go down there and get one, he said, and read it. So I went down and got one of those little testaments. Brought it back to my bed and laid down. Started reading a story about Lazarus. Where, he, where they came to Jesus and said, He whom thou lovest is sick. And in the meanwhile, Jesus stayed two more days where he was. And I guess it took him two more days to get where he was because he was dead four days. And his sisters came out and met him and said, If you had been here, our sister would not have died. Our brother, our brother would not have died. And both the sisters asked the same question. And then he walked up to the tomb and wept. And they said, I See how he loved him. He loved Lazarus so much he wept. And then he called Lazarus. And he prayed, just for the sake of those standing around. Prayed and asked God to call Lazarus by his name. And he came forth, bound in his grave clothes, and he said, Loose him and let it go. And when I hit that spot, faith leaped in my heart. Praise. I jumped out of the bed. I ran to the next room. I said, Man, it's not too late for us. We're not even dead yet. And Lazarus was dead four days, and God called him by his name. And he came forth bound in his grave clothes. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Hey, man, it's real. And what happened about your marriage? Did God oh, while, while I was in the hospital, my wife came back from California, got a job, got an apartment. And uh, on top of that, the government gave me a pension, total disability. And I drew it from February. 
uh, from May the 13th until sometime in March of 61, total disability while I was recovering from that cancer. And when I got well, they took my pension away. I went to work, worked 17 years with the Durham City School Maintenance Shop in Durham, North Carolina. I was paint for them for 14 years, and I retired five years ago this coming November. Still well, had a checkup with the doctor yesterday, blood sugar's right, blood pressure's right, everything's right. Still well. Strong as Amen. a man. <laughs> Feel good. Amen. Had took care of three or four different gardens this summer. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Still doing fine. Farmer is still in his blood. Yeah. And the Spirit of God is still in there. Amen. Amen. Let me read you these scriptures and you tell me what you think about them. Go right ahead. He was wounded for our transgressions. Yes. He was bruised for our iniquities. Yes, he was. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Oh, he bore it all. Yes. And with his stripes we are healed. That's one of the very scriptures I was quoting to myself, rolling it over in my mind as I lay on that x-ray table when they were making tests. And I got such a peaceful spirit came over me as I started seeing the vision. And I actually fell asleep, and the doctor came by and said, Boy, you're taking it easy, aren't you? I said, I never felt better. Anytime you feel the presence of God, you will never feel no better than that. Amen. And that's what I was feeling. I know that there are people watching this program that your testimony is going to help. Well, I sure hope so. I hope that the people that know me in the city of Henderson, I, I played baseball here years ago, and I know a lot of lot of people that knew me, and I wish that they could just realize how real God is. Amen. And I hope by some means, uh, by this testimony, they could see that what He's done for me, it'll be for them if they can just believe. Amen. Friends, there's an issue that you're going to have to face. Was this made up, or did it really happen? It really happened. Amen. I think you already are feeling the reality concerning what you've heard. We saw in the scriptures last week that the baptism of the Holy Ghost in Peter's words is for as many as the Lord our God shall call. The issue is, not is it real, but have you been called by God that's it. to the grace that's in Jesus Christ? This isn't an experience that was just, that is just for a select few or ever was just for a select few. But for as many as God calls into His grace. I believe that some of you out there watching us this morning are called by God and have heard of this experience and you know others who have had it, my hope is that testimonies such as this will encourage you to do what you have to do to receive it, which is turn it all over to Jesus and submit to His will. Now let me say a few more words. Go right ahead. You know, I'm not ashamed of this gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Amen. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed, Paul says, from faith to faith. For as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Praise God. A lot of people know a lot about the Lord and God in their, by reading the Scriptures. But what do they know about the Gospel of Christ, which is the power of God? And that's what's got to be preached in all the world before the end comes. Didn't Paul say that the kingdom of God is not in word but in power? That's right. We're, the kingdom of God and the gospel of Christ are, are not things just in words. Paul said, I didn't come unto you in word only. He told the Corinthians, I didn't come in the wisdom of man's speech or language, I came with the demonstrations of the Spirit and of power. Dear friend, my, my prayer for you today is that you will experience the reality of the power of God. I know what you mean when you say that it was so real that it frightened you. I've yes. heard many people yes. who have been baptized with the Spirit 
say that the first time they saw it or were around it, it made them a little jittery. Right. The first time the power of God fell down on me, it was like a warm, heavy quilt. It was so full of power and joy. It frightened me because that, that was the first time that I, that I knew completely beyond any shadow of a doubt that what I was believing was real. Yes, yes. It was something that I experienced. It wasn't something this person told me or that person told me or something I just thought. It, it came because I believed. Amen. Right. It is to those who believe. That's right. But the Gospel tells us in, in the Gospel of John, the seventh chapter, that those that believe should receive something. Yes. John 7, 37 and 38, Jesus, the great day of the feast, stood up and said, Everybody that's thirsting, come to Me. I'll give you something to drink, and out of your bellies shall flow rivers of living water. Praise God. Amen. John goes on to say, This spake He of the Spirit which they that believe on Him should receive. Yes. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, for that Jesus was not yet glorified. The disciples couldn't receive this Spirit. It was with them, but it wasn't in them. All the time Jesus was with them. He said, it's expedient that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. Jesus went away, yes. and He was glorified. And the Spirit came back as witness of that. And we are witnesses of it for your sakes today. Amen. It's for you. Don't be talked out of it by anybody. Don't let some man's theory or some man's doctrine keep you from what your soul is hungering for. Right. It's real. Oh, God. The door is open today. Amen. It may not be next year. I don't know. It may not. There's a t coming a time when it's going to be too late for anything. Today, the door is open. Today, people are receiving this experience. And I pray that you will seriously consider your part in the Pentecost experience. Now some believe they had received new wine so soon that morning. But Peter said, the Lord hath shed this blessing for your warning. Now when they heard the apostles word, their hearts were pricked within. What shall we do? We're asking you, they cried to hear from him. It is the Pentecost experience sent down for you and me. Sent down in love from God above to set all people free. Repent, he advised, and be baptized, everyone in Jesus' name. The Spirit then will come within and cancel all your shame. They gladly heard the apostles' word with fear on every soul. They found the way that very day, three thousand souls or more. It was the Pentecost experience sent down for you and me. Sent down in love from God above to set all people free. This blessing would, if understood, be pouring out today. It's only doubt that keeps it out, so why not stop and pray? Please never shun the unknown tongue, for it is God's expression. Through everyone when the spirits come and takes up his possession. It is the Pentecost experience sent down for you and me. Sent down in love from God above to set all people free. The Pentecost experience sent down for you and me. Sent down in love from God above to set all people free.